2002, late 2002, when the character's in his early 20s, and then with the second chapter, it jumps back to the mid-90s when he's in high school, and uh, the chapters alternate like that for a while. Um, it, writing the first chapter made me think, well, I, I sort of need to know something about how this guy got that way. Um, it's, it's interesting to, to open the book and be presented with him and sort of jump into his head, and it's a bit startling. And then you have a, a lot of questions that I felt like couldn't be answered unless we saw a little bit of the backstory. And so it, it came out like that. I started writing this book in about 2004 when the events of the Iraq war were, were very fresh and vivid and, and the war was still going on and the invasion was fresh in everybody's mind. Uh, and everyone was asking themselves how this could have happened. Um, there's a scene in this book which is a scene that's been that's occurred in about a dozen different novels over the past 10 years in which characters have an argument about whether the US and the UK and the rest of the coalition should be invading Iraq. Uh, there's one in a, Ian McEwan's book and there's one in uh, Joseph O'Neill's book and there's, it turns out that that was a sort of moment that um, impressed itself on a lot of fiction writers. Um, it was a situation in which there, there was a situation in which there was so much at stake and yet so much that not only was unknown, not only wasn't known, but that couldn't be known. Uh, and yet a decision had to be made and in the end a decision was made and it turned out to be a terrible, terrible decision. And life is full of situations like that. Everybody is walking around acting on incomplete information and, and knowing that they're acting on incomplete information and somehow having to act anyway. And most of us manage to get on with our lives in the face of that. Most of us obviously are not making consequential life and death political decisions, but most of us are making decisions about who we're going to marry and who we're going to fall in love with and where we're going to work and what we're going to do and what we're going to sign. And, um, and we're always doing that without enough information. And most of us manage to get on with it, nevertheless. Most of us manage to make those decisions somehow. And yet, I think a lot of people, certainly I've had the experience of being confronted with a situation like that and being completely paralyzed and not being able to move forward, not being able to make a decision, and not being able to not make a decision. Uh, and that was the situation in which the character in the book found himself. And so, of course, the, the line from Donald Rumsfeld, where the title of the book comes from, there are known knowns and the known unknowns, and there are also unknown unknowns. Uh, I think a lot of people, when he said that, sort of were struck by that line because, hey, you know, this legendary asshole has said something that's sort of profound and, and epistemologically accurate, uh, and it, it stayed with me too. Um, there are elements of the book that deal with the, the repressed and recovered and potentially false memories of sexual abuse, which uh, for those of us who were around in the mid-90s, um, especially in the United States, that was inescapable as a subject. That was the, the number one topic of the day on, on daytime television and on Oprah and on talk radio. Uh, and there was a massive explosion of discussion about this, of people coming forward and saying I, that they had uncovered memories of, of being abused. And then at a certain point, some of those stories began to be questioned. And then very quickly, that whole discussion, after dominating all of this media, um, just sort of disappeared. Uh, and that was curious to me as a guy watching the stuff. Uh, that Oh my God, everybody is talking about this, and now suddenly no one is talking about it. Um, and it wasn't as though the issue had been resolved in, in any way. Um, it was as though... It had, what had started as a, a, a sort of exciting and, and captivating story had suddenly become too complicated for the, the vessels in which it was being carried. And so, okay, let's move on to then. Let's find another exciting story. Uh, and that always stayed with me and, and was of interest to me. And, and I started reading up on it even back then before I, I thought about writing anything about it. Um, there have been, there's been a lot of good journalism about it. and, and um, then there's been some psychological research which I looked into for the book. Um, and it, it, again, I won't give too much away, but um, 
it did connect as I was writing the book. The reason it, it then came into the writing of the book is that um, it connected with what I was thinking about in terms of what we can know and what we can't know and having to, having to move forward and make decisions in the face of incomplete information. Uh, Eric is unlike me in more ways than I can really enumerate. He is a, a very adept computer programmer, whereas I am a barely competent computer programmer. He's extremely wealthy, whereas I am not extremely wealthy. Uh, he is a, a gentile of average height from suburban Colorado, whereas I am a Jew of higher than average height from, from a nice part of London. Um, most importantly, uh, I had a, I have very nice parents and I had a very nice upbringing and uh, uh, there were always lots of books in my house and there was always lots of discussion of books and, and interesting things and, and I had a lot of help. And from what we see of Eric and his childhood and his parents, he has very, very, very little help and everything that he's able to do, he's able to do in spite of his inheritance. Uh, and so in, in all of those ways, he's completely foreign to me. Is there a part of me that at times is excruciatingly self-conscious that I was able to sort of examine and, and give to the character and, and maybe exaggerate or maximize or uh, isolate? Uh, maybe, yeah, sure, yeah. But um, every character that you really Every character that really takes on, has any kind of life to it has those parts of you in it. And some of the less sympathetic and less likable characters I, I feel close to in, in a similar way. The, Eric's problem is that he doesn't have the appropriate checks and balances. Uh, and, and I have that same drive and those same qualities, but then I sort of know when to stop. And yet there's a part of me that wonders, what would it be like if you didn't stop, if you just kept going? And Eric is the person who just keeps going. The, the revelation of the, the NSA uh, spying and oversight, which seems to have come out yesterday as we're taping this, uh, obviously that's worrying and upsetting and I don't like it and I'm not happy about it. Uh, it it's also inevitable that as that kind of information exists, as we're creating that information just by going about our lives and emailing one another and being on Facebook and so on. Uh, it's inevitable that governments are going to want to get hold of it, store it, track it. Um, I, I think um, we're going to have to adjust to a world in which that information exists and, and that world is going to look different from the one in which uh, there simply wasn't that kind of a paper trail for the government to keep on you. Um, I don't have a real solution to it because I find it frightening just like everybody else does. Uh, on a personal level, I think what we're seeing and what we're going to keep seeing is people are going to learn to curate and control the information that they make public. And, and of course, everybody already does that with their social media presence. It's not uh, the naive approach would be simply to put all the information out there and let people see you, but I think most of us are a bit more canny than that and, and uh, in the same way that we would choose a wardrobe, we're choosing what we're going to project on social media and that is just now a, a life skill that my two-year-old daughter is going to have to learn at some point. Well, in, in the book when Eric makes that speech, he's defending a, a the software program that he made his fortune with, which is different from a social media network. What he, what he built was a sort of database of consumer information that could be useful to a big company to, to find demographic information about massive numbers of people. Um, and he argues, and I pretty much sympathize, um, that that stuff is usually pretty innocent because your individual preferences are subsumed in the massively aggregated statistical data. And that as, as a unique individual, you are of no real interest to a, a major corporation. You're only of interest as one data point in a, in a sea of data points. Um, that's very separate from, on the one hand, social media, which is to do with our human relationships, our one-to-one -one relationships. Uh, and on the other hand, our relationship with the government, which obviously uh, might have a whole different set of interests from the interests of a commercial enterprise.